thank our partners and look forward to yet another excellent forum. Uh, many of you will have uh, either been at or heard about the last one, which involved Gabor Meite. Uh, that um, forum is on the internet. It's on YouTube. Just Google Heartspeak Productions and you'll, uh, you'll find the material there. Our uh, first and keynote speaker will be Howard Sapers, who's the Correctional Investigator for Canada. It was a great hit last time, and uh, so we decided we'd have him this time, finishing off the series for this year, talking, of course, about a critically important issue for corrections, not only in Canada, but also in many other countries, and that's the, the aging process. Um, after Howard has finished, we'll take a refreshment break, and then we'll hear from the panelists. So without uh, further ado, as the cliche goes, Howard Sapers, who's the Correctional Investigator for Canada. Howard. Well, I'm going to get started because I actually have, surprisingly enough, a lot to say about this topic. And I just looked at the agenda for the first time and noticed that I'm restricted to about 40 minutes. So, believe it or not, I think I may have prepared more than that. So I'm going to get right to it. Um, but I do want to uh, thank, once again, the sponsors of the event, the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser, the Department of Criminology at Douglas College, and, of course, the Correctional Service of Canada for uh, sponsoring and co-hosting this terrific forum series. Um, they have consistently generated very high-quality discussion, and the legacy of those discussion lives on on YouTube because of the very high-quality productions that are made. So um, I think it's a very worthwhile resource for those of us who are interested in correctional matters and correctional policy matters. Um, now, as Correctional Investigator of Canada, my office serves essentially as an ombudsman. I am authorized under Part 3 of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act to investigate complaints and concerns of offenders as they relate to acts, omissions, decisions of the Correctional Service of Canada. Essentially, the role of the office is to provide oversight to the Correctional Service of Canada, make sure the correctional practice operates in compliance with the law, and is respectful of domestic and international human rights obligations. Now, I spend my days trying to make penitentiaries as good and useful as they can be. But please make no mistake, I think that incarceration should be used sparingly and as a last resort. Now, as I have stated elsewhere, prison populations do not necessarily reflect the worst of us, but they certainly do capture the impoverished, the poorly educated, the mentally ill, and the addicted. And increasingly, our prisons are, great, are home to greater numbers of the infirm, the impaired, and the aging. Now, the definition of older offender or elderly offender varies by jurisdiction. In the United States, the National Commission on Correctional Health calls inmates over 55 elderly, while 15 individual states place inmates over 50 years of age in that category. Now in Canada, our federal correctional authority does not have a definition or a dedicated strategy for this group of offenders, but generally speaking, the correctional service typically uses the 50-year benchmark to refer to aging elderly or older offenders. As in other jurisdictions, it is generally accepted that the aging process is accelerated by as much as 10 years or more in a custodial setting. Research suggests that long periods of incarceration and institutionalization are hard on both mental and physical health. The stress of life behind bars, coupled with years of difficult and unhealthy living before arriving in prison, can add years to the chronological age of incarcerated individuals. Other stresses, separation from family, uh, the prospect of go growing old in confinement, uh, the threat of victimization, account for the fact that an inmate's physiological age may exceed his or her chronological age. The older offender is an often neglected but significant and growing segment of the offender population. Today, close to 20% of the federal incarcerated population is aged 50 or over while 30% of offenders in the community are aged 50 or older. Consistent with the overall graying of the Canadian population, the number of older offenders in federal custody continues to grow annually. In the past decade, 
there has been more than a 50% increase in the number of older offenders under federal sentence. Reflecting an aging Canadian society, the proportion of older offenders under federal jurisdiction will continue to grow in the coming years. But the growth in our older offender population is not just a result of demographics or shifting incarceration rates. A wide range of sentencing reforms has recently been introduced. The cumulative impact, which has been to lengthen time served as a result of tightening of parole criteria, expanding mandatory minimum penalties, reducing credit for time served in remand or pretrial custody, and as of last week, as a result of the elimination of accelerated parole review. Over time, these reforms will result in more and more offenders spending more and more time incarcerated and growing old in prison. This results in what's known in the corrections business as the stacking effect. More people are being admitted to prison each year, and those who are already there are serving longer periods before their release. The more we add to the system, the more we stack them up. Other barriers to community release, delays in case preparation, a lack of programs, declining parole grant rates, guarantee that the number of longer serving offenders will continue to accumulate inside of our prisons. Of note, one of the impacts of this is that double bunking is expected to affect 30% of those in custody within the next three years. Today, the median age of an offender at admission to federal custody is 33 years and rising. Approximately 23% of the total offender population is serving a life or an indeterminate sentence. The majority of these offenders, 63%, are incarcerated with the remainder in the community. The incarcerated number close to 3,200. These life-serving offenders will almost assuredly become elderly before they are even considered eligible for parole. And at that, the average time, for in, uh, the average time served in prison for a first-degree murder conviction in Canada is 28.4 years. Now, there's two other points I want to mention at this point. Life sentence defenders released to the community are supervised until the time of their death. And lest you think that Canada is somehow less punitive than other jurisdictions, I'd like to remind you that time served in this country for first-degree murder is already greater than that of most of the advanced democracies in the world, including the United States, with the exception of the very, very rare life sentence without parole. Now, I cite these uh, statistics as context in the hope of framing the issue and the challenges that managing an aging offender population poses to Canada's correctional authority. This is not a new issue for corrections. In fact, concern about the growing number of older offenders has been appearing in academic literature for more than 20 years. The Correctional Service of Canada published its own first extensive research paper in this area in 1998. Optimistically, an older offender division was established within CSC's national headquarters in the year 2000. It was originally mandated to develop a sound correctional strategy and work plan tailored to the specific needs of the older offender population. However, just a few short years later, support and funding for this initiative just ran out of steam, and the division was eventually mothballed and declared moribund by the middle of the decade. In my last annual report, which was tabled in Parliament on November the 5th, 2010, um, I called upon the Correctional Service in that report to put a renewed focus on the issue. I expressed concern that health status admission assessment forms for those offenders aged 50 and older, or for those with self-care needs, had not been routinely completed, nor did they necessarily follow an offender to his or her home institution upon penitentiary placement. I called upon the Correctional Service to conduct a comprehensive health analysis of that segment of the incarcerated population aged 50 years and older and devise a strategy to meet current and anticipated physical health care needs in the areas of accommodation, program development, independent care and living, and conditional release planning and com on compassionate grounds. The Correctional Service of Canada responded that its research branch was to complete an analysis of older offenders which will, 
and I quote, assist with compiling a summary of needs and challenges associated with this segment of the population and look at developing an overall care strategy for this portion of the incarcerated population, end quote. Now, as commendable as these words may appear on paper, I am less than optimistic that a commitment to look at providing an initial analysis will translate into any dramatic improvement. My point here is that the Correctional Service of Canada does not currently have an older offender strategy to address the needs of the older offender population. I understand that the process of aging impacts each offender differently and that while some may not experience any apparent deterioration in physical health or mobility, others may be greatly impacted. I acknowledge that older offenders are, in fact, a diverse group, and attention must be paid to meeting needs on a case-by-case -case basis. However, it still seems that it's both desirable and necessary to develop a standalone strategy that would guide the activities of the service as they engage with this population over the short and the long term. At the very least, such a strategy would address those areas highlighted in my recommendation, accommodation, programming, independent care and living, and conditional release planning for compassionate reasons. Now, with your indulgence, I'll spend the remainder of my presentation exploring these themes and making the case why we need a dedicated strategy for older offenders in federal incarceration. A graying inmate population presents an array of demands and needs substantially different from that of the general population. I'm going to use Workworth Institution, a medium security penitentiary in the Ontario region that opened in 1967, to provide an example of some of the challenges the Correctional Service has in managing its older offenders. A recent snapshot of Workworth Institution found that the current count is 581 offenders. 21 percent of those offenders in this institution are aged over 50. On any given day, there's about 15 to 18 offenders who experience a major ambulatory issue requiring the use of a wheelchair, a walker, or a cane. These offenders are often unable to participate in routine activities such as recreation, programming, or meals in common areas. Health problems are prevalent, and several will require palliative care as a result of ongoing illness. Currently, there's only one psychologist on staff providing care for those close to 600 inmates. And nearly one quarter of the population is infected with hepatitis C. The treatment of chronic disease associated with aging, including cancer, emphysema, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hep C, and HIV AIDS, is becoming more of an issue as the proportion of older offender population increases. Treatment for these diseases often requires access to outside medical facilities. Many offenders will require palliative care as a result of chronic illness. The Correctional Service of Canada has done some research on their population and citing their own preliminary estimates from data that they manually collected between October of 2009 and January of 2010 the following general picture of inmate health across the system emerges. Estimates of a diagnosis of uh, diabetes is that 7% of the population are diabetic. Um, in this sample, 20% were positive for hepatitis C. 1.2% of the inmate population is HIV positive. Almost 20% are estimated to have a cardiovascular disease. 15.4% a respiratory condition, 6.5 a urological condition. Over 35 percent were found to have a mental health condition, 41 percent musculoskeletal issues, 12.5 percent to have a neurological problem, and 1.3 percent are estimated to need the use of an assistive device of some kind such as a cane or walker to assist in daily living. Now, although this data cannot be used to establish incident rates or compare the inmate population to the general population or even to make comparisons across regions or security levels, it, can, it does nevertheless present a picture of significant mental and physical health distress. What we can take away from these estimates is that the pressure on the Correctional Services of Canada $1.9, pardon me, $190 million health care budget will only intensify as the population continues to age. 
We know that elderly offenders use a disproportionate share of prison health care services. The physical and mental impacts of aging are hard on the human body. With age, bones become less dense, muscles shrink, and the general strength and vigor of youth slowly degrades. Older inmates have higher rates of both mild and serious health conditions. U.S. data suggests that older offenders on average are afflicted with three chronic health concerns. The most commonly reported amongst older offenders are arthritis, cardiovascular, endocrine, respiratory, and sensory deficits. This doesn't even include those dealing with ongoing substance abuse issues. Some older offenders find it difficult to maintain normal everyday routines, including eating, exercising, dressing, and personal hygiene as a result of their ongoing physical impairment. In the United States, prisons spend about two to three times more to care for older prisoners than younger inmates. According to estimates, the older inmate has five times as many visits to healthcare facilities than similarly aged people who are not incarcerated. In 2008, at least 13 states had dedicated units for older inmates. Six had dedicated prisons. Nine had dedicated secure medical facilities. Five had dedicated secure nursing homes and eight had dedicated hospice facilities. Although we are far from rep replicating the kind of U.S. numbers and conditions here in Canada, we nevertheless face many of the same challenges. Aging prison population, increasing costs, and overcrowded facilities. Thankfully, we're not yet at the point, as some states are, where, they're, where they are constructing separate, fully functioning hospitals complete with a dementia unit, dialysis lab, a geriatric unit, an infirmary, and other facilities and services specifically for the aging and chronically ill. That said, the prospect of moving shackled, sick, and elderly inmates back and forth between prisons and public hospitals and racking up the increased escort and transport medical costs related to that transportation is hardly a suitable Canadian alternative. Mental health concerns impact an older offender's ability to, to live normally in a prison setting, including their participation in daily institutional routines, as well as their ability to live independently and with dignity. Although research examining the experience of older offenders with mental illness is relatively sparse, studies that do exist indicate an overrepresentation of mental illness amongst older offenders. The most common mental health disorders amongst elderly offenders are depression, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, anxiety, and late life schizophrenia. Offenders that may be suffering from age-related degenerative disease characterized by memory loss or distorted thinking often exhibit behaviors that are considered maladaptive in a correctional setting. Symptoms may include disruptive or difficult behavior, anxiety, paranoia, major depression, self-injury, and the refusal or inability to follow prison rules and routines. We know that the mentally ill as a result end up being subject to more than their share of use of force and more than their share of placements in segregation. We know that approximately 30% of male and 50% of male inmates over the period of their incarceration have a mental health issue that would benefit from an intervention. We know that the service struggles to meet this need. And we know that this challenge is only going to become more difficult as the population ages. Generally speaking, we know that mentally disordered offenders are less likely to complete correctional programs, are often subject to disciplinary sanctions or placed in segregation due to their disruptive behaviors. A limited literature suggests that mentally ill older offenders are also more likely than their peers to be victims of inmate on inmate violence, intimidation, harassment, and bullying. Older offenders with mental health concerns require individualized treatment and care in a correctional setting. As many older offenders experience physical health care issues in addition to their mental health concerns, it is increasingly necessary to tailor interve interventions to both mental and physical health needs of this population. If, and if, for those of you who don't recognize it, that's one of my favorite places. That's uh, Kingston Penitentiary. The physical design and infrastructure of a typical, uh, typical federal penitentiary do not take into account the needs of aging or elderly offenders. The average age of Canada's prison estate is now 47 years, 
Several penitentiaries are designated heritage buildings, and five were built between 1835 and 1900. The penitentiaries in operation today were designed for young men, and they were not typically very accessible to the mobility or sight impaired. Physical ambulation and accessibility, independent care and living, palliative care, employment and vocational programming are some of the issues that older offenders face with respect to the phys physical conditions and limitations of the prison environment. Retrofitting our institutions with special assistive devices and equipment to meet everyday housing or ambulatory, toileting, bathing and feeding needs for a growing segment of the population is an expensive enterprise, especially considering that several facilities have already outlived their expected lifespan. We are now squeezing a growing proportion of older offenders into already overcrowded prisons that were designed and built for a younger generation. Offenders with mobility concerns may also feel threatened by the general inmate population. Institutions which have designated ranges or units for older offenders are often set apart from the main parts of the prison, which impacts on the offender's ability to participate in institutional routines. For some older offenders with mobility impairments, it can be an overwhelming experience just to access fresh air exercise or participate in yard or other regular and institutional activities. Physically segregated, the older offender may also feel isolated, abandoned, and marginalized. As a group, older inmates often have little social status within the prison order. Coupled with diminishing physical strength, they may be more victimized by intimidation, muscling, or bullying by younger, stronger, and more aggressive inmates. Younger inmates may act on and exploit ageist attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors in the form of taunts, ridicule, manipulation, harassment, or even assaults that deprive elderly offenders of their safety and security. In general, prison victimization research confirms the following. Older offenders are victimized by younger inmates. Older offenders feel vulnerable to attack by younger offenders. Older offenders prefer to live with inmates in their own age bracket, and inmates may live in age-segregated protective custody units for much of their incarceration. In his research on older offenders, John Krebs has qualitatively documented various forms of inmate-on-inmate -inmate victimization, psychological, property, physical, and sexual, perpetrated by younger offenders against older inmates. His research points to the fact that a large proportion of older prisoners are also sex offenders, and that this predisposes them to victimization based on their offense category. Some suggest that older sex offenders are subjected to the highest level of discrimination of any offender group by virtue of their age, offense category, and prevailing attitudes of other offenders. Older offenders typically require a number of prescription medications to manage their physical and mental health care needs. These prescriptions are very often very expensive and in high demand within the institutional black market. My office continues to see cases where older, more disabled offenders are bullied or intimidated into giving up their prescription meds to offenders involved in the institutional drug trade. In cases where the offender obtains drugs directly from an institutional nurse, their medication schedule is vulnerable to sudden changes in the institutional regime to facilitate searches, lockdowns, training, or other activities of this nature. While CSC policy indicates that access to healthcare services should not be limited as a result of changes to the institutional regime, the reality is that even the slightest of delays in the delivery of prescription meds could have potentially deleterious effects on the older offender population. I'll just share two quick examples with you. Recently, I visited Nova Institution, one of the five uh, regional institutions for women. This is in the Atlantic region. There are three uh, medication parades a day, um, lineup of the women for their daily medications. Um, because of the demand for meds and because of the physical design of that particular institution, that lineup is outside, 365 days a year, seven days a week. They line up outside waiting for their medications. So in the spring and the summer, uh, that's not so bad in Truro, Nova Scotia. Um, but for those of you who have been there, it can be a rather unpleasant experience, uh, particularly if you're an anxious elderly offender waiting for your medication. Um, in another recent example, there was an extended lockdown at a maximum security institution here in the Pacific region. 
um, healthcare workers were prevented by security staff of visiting the range um, that was being searched. Um, even though security staff were alerted that one of the inmates being uh, locked down um, had a particular health care need that, would, uh, that if he didn't have his medications would result in convulsions and perhaps slipping into a coma. Um, even with that information, the medication was not allowed to be delivered. The um, offender did, in fact, go into a coma. Um, and the result of that, of course, was even more of a security concern as outside paramedics had to be called and the uh, lockdown and the search that was going on had to be further interrupted so that emergency medical arrangements could be made to transport that inmate to an outside hospital. Um, so uh, these are not um, hypothetical considerations. Changes in normal prison routines and structures can be especially difficult for older offenders. For example, recent changes to CSC's drug formulary, um, this is the, um, the, the, the plan that determines what uh, medications are going to be routinely made available as opposed to those that won't be routinely made available, determined um, as well whether certain medications will be covered and whether particular over-the-counter medications will be supplied has had a, a differential effect on older offenders. Uh, for example, uh, some simple digestive aids are no longer generally available and some inmates don't have the means to purchase them. Now, all offenders are required to purchase from their own funds many over-the-counter health items for their personal use. Although an older offender may qualify under exceptional circumstances for a higher allowance, it would not be uncommon for a retirement or pensioned aged inmate to be allocated a basic maintenance allowance of $2.50 a day or less. The equivalent of retirement pay in prison is often woefully inadequate and certainly does not go very far in meeting basic health, comfort, and hygiene needs for the elderly that may fall outside of CSC's essential health care service delivery guidelines. Pressures on the Correctional Service of Canada to deliver correctional programs in a timely fashion in advance of parole eligibility dates results in many offenders with long-term sentences not getting access to programs until very late in their sentence. On any given day, only about 25% of offenders are actually engaged in their core correctional programs. Older offenders may not be considered as high a priority for programming and vocational training as younger inmates. They may not participate fully or as enthusiastically in such program when it is made available. Moreover, the services focus on vocational training, employment and employability, building skills to address uh, a deficit in, in, in job skills, low educational attainment or motivation, may not be relevant to older adults who may be approaching or past retirement age. The structure and content of existing correctional programming may have little relevance to their life status. Now, I would argue that an elderly inmate is equally deserving of rehabilitation and reintegration support during their incarceration. However, there is often little appropriate activity provided in either regard for older inmates. Studies suggest that aging inmates rarely access existing counseling, educational, or vocational prison programs. Many aging offenders simply elect to spend long periods of time locked in their cells during working or programming hours. This is not rehabilitation and it's not productive. Ensuring the relevance and appropriateness of correctional programming for older offenders is a task that is made more difficult by the fact that some older offenders, because of advancing age, are less competent or able to comprehend, interact, and engage in programming that may be aimed at addressing their criminogenic needs. Older offenders often re require specific accommodations in order to participate in correctional programming. They may require shorter sessions, enhanced accessibility and assistive aids, and even more frequent bathroom breaks. Small changes to the way that programming is delivered have the potential to greatly impact participation rates and success rates of older offenders. CSC's current program model primarily focused on intensity levels, may not adequately reflect or appropriately correspond to the needs of these older offenders. There are two forms of compassionate release available to offenders in Canada. Under Section 121 of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, 
parole may be granted in an exceptional case to an offender who A, is terminally ill, B, whose physical or mental health is likely to suffer serious damage if he or she continues to be held in confinement, or C, for those for whom continued confinement would constitute an excessive hardship that was not foreseeable at the time of sentencing. This legislative provision does not apply to offenders serving a life sentence or an indeterminate sentence. In order for a release by exception to be granted in advance of day or full parole, the offender must be ineligible for any other form of release, and the release should not in any manner present an undue risk to society. Under the criminal code, there is also a little known and even less used provision called the royal prerogative of mercy. This provision is exercised by the Governor General and Council, that really means the federal cabinet, upon recommendation from the Minister of Public Safety or at least one other minister. It is an exceptional provision that allows for a life sentence defender with a terminal illness to be considered for a conditional pardon and released to the community. According to the Parole Board, there must exist substantial evidence of excessive inequity, substantial injustice, or undue hardship, which would be out of proportion to the nature and seriousness of the offense and the resulting consequence. The royal prerogative of mercy is a remedy used under the most exceptional of circumstances and reserved for only the most deserving of cases. In practice, compassionate release of a terminally ill offender to the community to be cared for by his or her family or to die with dignity is rare. The criteria to satisfy a release by exception under the CCRA or conditional pardon are basically the same, but they are extremely difficult to meet. Even the most deserving of cases can be discouraged from applying. The referral and review process is complicated and lengthy and the criteria have been further narrowed over the last few years to leave little in the way of discretion or compassion. The last numbers I have are from 2008. The Parole Board of Canada received 21 Royal Prerogative of Mercy requests and none were granted. In the last five years, there have been 22 parole by exception decisions issued by the Parole Board. 12 were granted. Of the 10 that were denied, four later died in prison. Notwithstanding these low referral and grant rates, my office sees cases where the nature and circumstances of the offender's terminal illness would seemingly fit the parole by exception criteria, but the applications were either not considered or supported or prepared as, as diligently as they may have been. The fact of the matter is that releases of inmates to die with dignity in the community are too often dismissed on technical and procedural grounds. That being said, release of a terminally ill offender from prison is often complicated by the fact that that offender may have little in the way of community or family support. And this is especially true in the case of longer serving inmates where primary relationships may be strained or severed altogether. The result of all this is that a number of very ill offenders suffering from life-threatening, non-curable illness are dying in federal penitentiaries, sometimes in very tragic and less than dignified conditions. Without release on compassionate grounds, many offenders die without the opportunity to spend palliative time with the support of family and friends and to bring emotional closure to what have often been very difficult relationships. Managing terminally ill offenders consumes a lot of time and a lot of resources. It's an expensive and often exhausting endeavor. CSC's palliative care guidelines recognize an offender may have been ill for a very extended period of time and in many cases have few ties and supports outside the prison walls. The correctional service tries to assist offenders in living their remaining time in comfort and dignity and wherever possible for them to live in the environment of their choice. The service aims to deliver palliative care in a non-judgmental and compassionate manner. That being said, it's clear that relieving suffering and providing end-of-life care presents practical, ethical, and moral challenges in a correctional setting. And while there are positive, commendable, and dignified practices in palliative care occurring in the most inhospitable of places, these are mostly thanks to the local initiative, compassion, and effort of dedicated and committed individual staff members and inmate peers, and not as the result of a coordinated implementation 
of a coherent policy. Offenders that have been incarcerated for long periods of time exhibit behaviors that indicate institutionalization. They become acclimatized to the prison environment and they rely on the institutional routine to determine their daily activities. They often have great difficulty adapting to life in the community, which can appear foreign, bewildering, unsafe, and intimidating after a long period of incarceration. I can think of several examples of offenders telling me after coming out of prison after a long sentence that they found themselves doing things like standing in front of doors waiting for them to open because it had been such a long time since they've opened up a door for themselves. Um, institutionalization affects every aspect of their life. Many long-term and older offenders experience a loss of community and family ties and relationships over the period of their incarceration. Relationships may have been strained or lost as a result of their incarceration. For many offenders, family members and friends may have passed away while they were in custody. Not only are these offenders returning to a community that they may longer recognize, but they also may not have family or friends to help support their transition. Older offenders often experience anxiety around financial stability and support in the community when they are released at retirement age or older. Recent legislative changes have heightened this anxiety. And the inmate allowances that I mentioned a few minutes ago have not been adjusted since 1986. They may require extra support and care through their reintegration in order to attend appointments, obtain medication, and live independently. In addition to the funding and income support issues, a primary concern and fear of the older offender is the inability to access appropriate health care once in the community. While community correctional facilities, halfway houses, parole officers, and nonprofit groups like the John Howard and Elizabeth Fry societies go a long way to support the reintegration of offenders into the community, older offenders may continue to experience <clears throat> excuse me, difficulty adjusting to life beyond the prison walls. There needs to be more coordination between the provinces and federal corrections to achieve better supports and options upon release. It is critically important that older offenders are provided advanced explanations of the services and entitlements that may be available to them when they return to the community, how these can be accessed, and what the expectations and responsibilities that will be placed on them will be once they leave prison. Every year, on average, about 60 federal inmates die, many from so-called natural causes. Several of these deaths are managed as palliative or hospice cases in an offender's home penitentiary. I would submit that there is nothing natural about ending your days confined to an infirmary bed hooked up to an oxygen tank behind razor wire. There needs to be changes if our older generation of offenders are to age and die with some degree of dignity while serving their sentence. For the most part, as a group, the older offender population poses little substantive risk of reoffending. In general, older offenders present little or no control problems for correctional authorities. Indeed, most, most research suggests that longer serving offenders are much easier to manage because they are less likely to escape, violate prison rules, or receive disciplinary sanctions. Research has also consistently concluded that age is one of the most significant predictors of future recidivism. Criminal activity peaks late in adolescence or early adulthood and decreases as a person ages. Many offenders simply age out of crime and are much less likely to commit additional crimes after their release. Now on the other hand, early release of the terminally ill, bedridden or severely, severely incapacitated offender runs up against some other criminal justice goals and priorities such as denunciation, deterrence, and incapacitation. <clears throat> we are reminded of the fact that although severe illness and deteriorating health may cause hardship for individual offenders of advancing age, it does not in and of itself constitute a sufficient reason to grant a conditional pardon or a compassionate release. But I think we can still fulfill the denunciatory aspect of, the, of incarceration while acting humanely and with compassion. The challenge is to make existing policies and practices more effective and to identify and assess new approaches to managing an aging population that's expected to grow. There is little doubt that the combined effects of an inadequate prison infrastructure 
and increased mobility and impairment needs of older offenders will be an area of growing concern in federal corrections. In that vein, the Correctional Service may need to consider age-segregated living arrangements for older prisoners at each security level within a region. Care should be taken so that centralization of services do not further isolate or marginalize older prisoners from access to other prison activities and release options. The service needs to develop a more appropriate range of programming and activities tailored to the older offender, including physical fitness and ex exercise regimes, as well as other interventions that are responsive to their unique mobility, learning, and independent living requirements. A national older offender strategy is needed, and it would, and it would of course include a geriatric release component. CSC needs to enhance post-release supports for the older offender and hire more staff with training and experience in palliative care and gerontology. Sensitivity and awareness training regarding issues affecting older offenders should be added to the training and refresher curriculums for both new and experienced staff. Existing facilities may need to be retrofitted with the needs of an older offender in mind. Where new construction is planned, the impairments of aging must now be part of the physical design plan and include a sufficient number of accessible living cells. There is as well an identified need for further Canadian research in this growing area, as most of the research currently comes from the United States or the United Kingdom. Such studies would better inform and guide Canadian policymakers and prison managers. A failure to anticipate a growing offender population and related cost increases will place further constraints on correctional budgets and decision making in the very near future. As a society, we need to pay more attention to sentencing reforms and parole practices that have contributed to more offenders serving more of their sentences in prison and growing old inside as a result. The stacking effect that I spoke about is upon us now. I would remind us all that our jails and prisons are already operating at capacity. In managing the growing wave of older offenders, it would be wise to avoid some of the mistakes that we have already made along the way in regards to the mentally ill. Just as prisons today have become the new asylums, we do not want our prisons of tomorrow to become the new geriatric facilities. I want to thank you for your patience as I have raised these issues and concerns. Thank you again for the opportunity to address you, and I look forward to your questions. Corrections just had a huge influx of funding, as a matter of fact, and there's billions more planned. Um, I think it's a matter of priority and emphasis. Um, in the rush to lock more people up, I think we have to slow down a little bit and, and make sure that uh, we can at least handle what we've got and that we're doing it in a way that, uh, that meets our needs overall. Um, can you say something about the type of prisoner population that you're talking about by that? I mean, I realize you may be preaching to a bit of a converted audience, um, but a lot of people might say, yes, but these are bad people. They've committed serious offenses, and they're in the federal penitentiary system. So can you s say a little bit about who these people actually are, i.e., lots of poor people who um, came up through the uh, system committing petty offenses for years that then eventually wind them up with a federal sentence, or as you say, sex offenders who that may have themselves been victims. Um, yeah, uh, very complicated question, and thank you. I'll try to address it a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, um, the crimes that we are most afraid of and the crimes that cause the most um, concern in terms of criminal justice re reform are thankfully the rarest crimes. So the serious sexual assaults, serious violent crimes, murder, um, are relatively rare. The, 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 the count today inside federal penitentiaries is just over 14,000. Um, amongst that is about 3,200 individuals that are serving time, a life sentence for first or second degree murder. Um, and many of them have been there for years and years and years. Um, we know that violent crime is actually down. We know that sexual offenses are actually down. Um, so what we're talking about are other kinds of crimes. So we're talking about a lot of property crimes, a lot of drug-related crimes. Um, and for these offenders, they're typically serving 
shorter sentences. The average length of time served in a federal penitentiary now is something just shy of four years. Um, but we're seeing these offenders also change in their profile in a few other ways. Um, as I said, approaching now 30% mentally ill, 80% with a substance abuse history, most with a less than grade eight education. Um, an increasing number with that are fetal alcohol affected. Um, uh, the rate, the, the, the proportion of the incarcerated population that are Aboriginal is now about 20%. Uh, for women, it's about 50%. Um, the largest growing category of offenders being sent to federal penitentiaries right now are Aboriginal women. Um, and if you look at the life history of most of these women, you would be very hard pressed to make a distinction about whether they are victims or offenders. Um, so we're talking about a very complex population and not a population that has been convicted of the most serious or horrific crimes but often a population um, that are chronically involved with the criminal justice system as a result of other issues, um, including their, um, their mental health, their, their, um, uh, their inability to participate in employment, um, lack of educational attainment, et cetera. Um, so uh, the, uh, and these are also the individuals that have the lowest chances of success in terms of current correctional programming or release, um, are successful release once they are released on parole. This is also the same population that are most often having their paroles revoked or suspended. So. Um, in terms of uh, compassionate release, how does it work if someone wants to process that type of release? Can For, question, how does compassionate release work? So the, the, the offender would meet uh, typically with their parole officer, their institutional parole officer, and there's a process to go through in terms of assessing the criteria for compassionate release. And as I say, there's, there's a difference between that and the royal prerogative of mercy. So one applies to those serving a life or an indeterminate sentence. The other applies to those who aren't serving a life or an indeterminate sentence. Um, and you can't be eligible for any other form of release. So that means you are not eligible. You're not at your day parole or your full parole eligibility. You're, for, some, for some reason, you're not eligible for unescorted temporary absences, et cetera. Given the very conservative uh, political atmosphere that seems to prevail in Ottawa, uh, you bringing forward these kinds of observation commentaries can't sit well with the Minister of Public Safety. I was wondering what sort of relationship you have with him. <laughs> A full and um, productive relationship. Thank you for asking. <laughs> we, um, we actually, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's a challenging environment um, for anybody in corrections um, because corrections has become a very political issue. Um, but I will say that my reports are well received. Um, they're tabled in Parliament annually. I meet with the minister when I need to. Um, not just this minister, but all the ministers since I've been appointed. Um, and of note, I was appointed by a liberal government. I was reappointed by a conservative government. So. Um, I think that um, they do take this issue seriously, and I think that uh, a lot of that has to do with the relationship between the Correctional Service of Canada and my office. Um, but that's not to say it's not without its challenges. <laughs> the uh, criminal code allows for conditional sentences to be monitored electronically. Of course, that has to be two years less a day, which is a provincial sentence. Um, I'm wondering whether or not the feds have considered that um, on, as sort of a, an avenue for the folks that could be let out on a compassionate basis or developing it that way so that they're actually monitored and they can get their medical care and things like that on the street. Um, electronic monitoring has been considered by the Correctional Service of Canada and by the federal government. Um, I, I, my, I, and I'm not expert on this, but my understanding of the research is such that for this population of offenders, if they would already meet the low risk criteria, um, then the electronic monitoring might be um, more than what is necessary. So for the offenders that are conditionally and compassionately released, they're already able to be monitored either through existing parole support or through 
uh, released to home communities, uh, often in, in, in circumstances of Aboriginal offenders, or being released to uh, supportive family environments. So the electronic monitoring doesn't appear to be much of an issue. Like, are these elderly people in gangs? I haven't run across a lot of gang involvement from older offenders. There are, there are, there are in fact, older offenders. I'm, I'm thinking of one right now who is fairly notorious um, was, and was part of a motorcycle club that will go unnamed. Um, <laughs> Because they know where I live, and um, the uh, uh, and and you know he maintained a fair amount of power and influence as he aged in prison. Um, but I think that's a relatively rare example. Um, a lot of the a lot of the, the the gangs tend to be interested in recruiting younger, more mobile offenders, uh, offenders that are moving back and forth between penitentiary and community, moving into communities. Um, in fact, we're seeing, uh, sadly younger offenders coming into prisons with no previous gang affiliation telling the correctional authorities that they are members of gangs so that they get accepted into the prison culture that way. Um, so, it, it, you know, gang involvement is very complicated, but I, I just, I haven't seen a lot of older offenders um, participate in gang activities. All right, I'm going to cut it off at this point and take a break.